Good morning to you this morning and welcome to Forest Heights Baptist Church. We're glad you're here and hope that uh, you can come out and visit us in person. We're at 804 Tanger Drive in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. If you have a Bible this morning, I invite you to turn with us to the Old Testament book, 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 24. We'll be reading at verse 16 as we continue our study through uh, 1 Samuel and we're down to chapter 24. We'll be reading verse 16 through 22 today. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I think you're going to be able to follow along with me. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me in, what, in, that, what you did not, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. So we remember that David had encountered Saul in the cave and uh, Saul didn't know that. Uh, David was uh, had an opportunity to defeat Saul there soundly in the cave. Uh, he wouldn't, he didn't even know David and his men were in the cave. And, uh, but David uh, chose not to do that, but merely to cut off the corner of his robe to uh, indicate that he had the opportunity. As uh, soon as uh, Saul had left uh, the cave, David uh, comes out and points out what he has done and uh, and appeals to Saul that he's not worthy of being chased and killed, that he's not done anything to Saul. And uh, in other words, he pleaded his case. And we say that last week. And now uh, when David got finished speaking to Saul, Saul's uh, reaction, we're all waiting to find out what would he do. Uh, you know that Saul was prone to mood swings and and uh, he had obviously uh, uh, animus toward David that he was such that he wanted to chase him all over the country to defeat him. He brought 3,000 troops with him and all that and uh, in an effort to get David. And now here is David uh, basically presenting himself uh, there to Saul and appealing his case. And so what is Saul's reaction? Well, of course, he uh, is caught uh, really, I think, uh, in, a di in a different mood. Uh, this whole action of David has brought Saul into a different place. And no doubt the Lord put his hand on Saul and tenderized his heart to hear David say all these things. And Saul says, is that your voice, my son? Notice he calls him my son. That's not to be overlooked. That's a term of endearment. And he, uh, he speaks to, to David that way. And then it says in verse 16 that Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And then he goes on to describe uh, today what he sees as David's situation here and how he has reacted to it. And this is just a very different Saul than we're used to seeing. We know that Saul uh, was uh, a man whose mood could be this way, certainly, but not, but not often. Most of the time he was in fits of rage. That's why he got David to come uh, to his aid a long time ago. So what we find here, what can we get glean from this reaction between Saul and David? And by the way, uh, not to give away anything that you haven't already read, I'm sure, but Saul uh, here is very tender and very uh, reconciling, if you will, to Dave with David. But uh, Saul will, uh, this will not last a long time for Saul. It's not certainly not the end of the story with Saul, but uh, but it's certainly a, a very unexpected one, I guess, considering Saul's personality and, and the links that he's gone to and the words he's spoken against David. So what I want to do here is, and I, you know, 
to help us to get, take, take something away from this for our own benefit is that notice that Saul, if, if anything here, has set up in my mind a path of reconciliation. David uh, was conciliatory in the fact that he didn't, uh, he doesn't kill Saul. But we know David's never really trying to kill Saul. He's always trying to appeal his case to Saul that he's not who Saul has heard and all that. And we talked about that. But we never seen Saul too often. He doesn't seem to be up until now in the, in, in, in the mood to reconcile in any fashion with David, not to reconcile with David as his, as his trusted servant, as he calls him here in verse 16. This is terribly unusual considering the context here that he calls him my son. And it's also unusual that he acknowledges that David has done something that he hasn't done. He's returned good to evil. And that uh, other thing we notice here that David, that he says, David, you're going to be the king, which is the whole problem Saul had anyway. He was jealous of David and so on and so forth. And so uh, he also uh, makes a request that, you know, as the king, he didn't have to request, you know, he didn't request things. He ordered things and they were done. So you see a different Saul here. And I think that Saul is demonstrating uh, from the point of view of a person like Saul, who was angry, moody at the very least, angry certainly was his most common mood, the one we read about, fits of rage and, and just, just obsessed with getting rid of David and jealousy and all the things that we know about Saul up to this point. He represents here an unusual and perhaps unexpected reconciliation. And I want to use Saul then here to tell us how, if, if, if you know somebody or if you are that somebody, and I think I won't presume too much here, but I think we've all been, uh, certainly maybe uh, many of us have been at one point or the other, certainly a common human problem to be the, the wrong side of, of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the dispute, right? Been on the side of the anger, the moody, the whatever person, and, and for us to come over or to make a change has been a drastic. Maybe you can look at it this way. Maybe it's a, you, you've uh, been away from Christ a long time, your whole life. You've always been against him and, and against the whole idea of, of salvation and the Christian teachings and the Bible and all that. And, and you have a, seemed like a long way to go. I know people say, well, I've spent my whole life you know, putting that, the church down and the, and the things of God down. And now how do I, am I going to get to come to that place? It's almost like I can't do it because I've spent so much time uh, going the other way and not just uh, by myself, but I've actually, you know, been aggravated again, aggravated the church and picked on the church. There's a lot of ways to look at this. If it's not some personal thing, it's certainly many people, I think, honestly, have spent a lot of time trying to drive a wedge between them and God. And and they may have successfully driven the wedge in there, but that doesn't change God's position. But for them to come over is a very big hill to climb in, in words that we might often use. So what I want to do here is I want to help us see a path to reconciliation uh, from that side of the fence, not from the person who's offended. David's already shown his side and he was always trying to reconcile with Saul, but uh, Saul was the one who kept it going. And I made this so that you can maybe remember this, right? Uh, maybe you can remember this uh, and, and maybe you, the, this word will go. The, the, so the points are going to be these wor words that relate to this letters of the word reap, R-E-A-P, reap. So if you want to find a path of reconciliation or you're trying to help somebody who's that far away, here is the word reap and maybe it'll help you remember the steps. One of the things we want to notice right away though uh, is that David uh, has gives Saul a soft answer. David was uh, gave Saul a soft answer. He didn't approach him with hard words. And the Bible says in Proverbs that a soft answer turns away wrath. And harsh words stir up anger. That was Saul. He was the harsh words guy. David was the soft words guy. And on David's side, again, we want if we're trying to exemplify this and we're helping people, remember this, other Proverbs 16, 32, where it says that whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit uh, than he who takes a city. In other words, the person who's slow to anger and is able to control himself 
is greater than uh, the, than the person who can can overcome a city. Well, this is again David and Saul. This is the this is the kind, soft answer David up against, and he was not a soft man, but a soft person in that sense. He was, but but he was a great warrior. But he was also very kind to Saul, even though Saul done nothing to deserve it. So he's exemplifying what the Bible says. And uh, Saul is maybe at this point, God is the Bible, as God puts it, the word puts it, God's words never return void. The, the gentleness of David, the persistence of David, the willingness of David to be faithful creates in Saul a, a, a tender moment because there's no question it begins with, and is this your voice, my son? Term of endearment. So Saul has swung from anger to tenderness. And uh, this is something here. So how did he get there? Well, the first thing I say he does, is he recognizes his heir. So the person who has a way to go, uh, the Saul in, in, this, uh, in this effort to reconcile, the Saul person has to recognize their heir. David has done nothing to offend Saul, so there's nothing for him to recognize in that sense. Saul has to come to the place where he says, I've done it. I've made a mistake. I'm the one that's wrong here. And uh, that's, you know, that's what he does in verse 17. He says, you are more righteous than I. Can you imagine if you, if you've been with us and read through the Bible, read about Saul and looked at his personality, can you imagine him ever saying something like that? This has to be the work of God in his heart. You know, when people come to Christ, they have to be willing, the Bible says, to confess our sins. We have to own up to the fact that we can't get there by ourselves. That's confessing your error. That's recognizing your error. So the reap has a uh, first letter R, recognizing your error. He says to him, you have repaid me good where I've repaid you evil. He doesn't just say, I made a mistake or two. He says, you've actually done better than me. You've, you've not just been neutral, but you've given me good versus my, my giving you evil. And this is something that he says in verse 18, he dealt with me well. And you could have killed me, but you didn't. And notice what he says, when the Lord put me in your hands, Saul recognizes that God has, has put him in the place where he could have been killed by David and David didn't. So Saul is, is, is open to the idea there that he was wrong. And then he says in verse 19, he says in the first part of it, he says, if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? Again, Saul recognizes the common way that people do business. If you have an enemy, you never, ever uh, change that. You try to get even or you try to raise, the, do whatever the score is, even at the score, right? And so Saul is expressing on this path to reconciling with David, and it's really reconciling with God, isn't it? And isn't that what really people do when they come to Christ? They have to reconcile. Recognizing our error in the situation is the first step. The second thing is to esteem them before the Lord. What does that mean? We need, to, we need to recognize the person who has made this possible. So if we're having a relationship and a person's struggling and, we're, and, we, and we have done that and we're the person on the side, we're the Saul in this argument or Saul in this situation, we recognize that we made a mistake and then we want to recognize that this person has gone overboard and out of their way to, to help us fix this. You see, it's one thing to to try to fix something. But when somebody who's been wronged, as David has been and is being wrong, has gone out of the way, what does Saul do? Verse 19, the second part. So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. He is esteeming David worthy of rewards from God. Saul recognized that David has done something that's godly. And uh, may God bless you for that, right? May God reward you for that. So he esteems him, a uh, David. And so when we're in this situation, if we're the Saul person in that argument and we want to recognize our error and we want to thank the person, if you will, to esteem them, to thank them for this idea that they came and went out of their way to make it possible for us to do this. And so when you do this, you have to stop and think about this. Saul recognizes something here that's way bigger than David and him that there's the Lord is involved and he gives the Lord credit. You could have never, why would you persist in witnessing to me? Why Lord would you go to the cross for me? I've done nothing but, but talk bad against you the whole time. Think of, of Paul. Think of him. He's not worthy of anything. And he recognizes that 
and he thanks the Lord for his patience to come unto him and serves him uh, the rest of his life. This is a person who, who goes from a long way away to close, right? And comes, these are the kinds you hear about. These are the testimonies you hear about. That doesn't mean that that's the only kind of testimony. Although the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short, we recognize that some people have gone out of their way to, to disavow the church and all that goes on there versus other people who just kind of quietly, you know, didn't do anything and just kind of lived their life. And I don't know, I, honestly, goodness, I think the people who, who pretend to be Christians or pretend that the church is irrelevant and doesn't even take up the time to, to ta tackle it are the more dangerous and the more farther, are the farther away people. But anyway, he recognizes his error and then he esteems Right, he esteems them. That would be David. In this case, he Saul esteems David before the Lord. You and I need to recognize the person who has who has brought this to us, and who is the one in, that we have come against, and and ask the Lord, thank the Lord for them being willing to to try to make up with us. You know, so many times there's relationships when we've broken the relationship, we've been the Saul in that relationship, we've broken it, and we really want, wish we had it back. But our pride gets in our way and won't let us, you know, uh, say anything. We can't even give them a thank you for sticking with me on this because I know that I've done nothing to, uh, to earn this. That's what Saul is saying in verse 19. So we recognize, we esteem, and then we acknowledge. So what does that mean? We're going to acknowledge their position. What is he doing? Now look at verse 20. Saul recognizes that David, that he was in error and David wasn't. He also lifts up David before the Lord and thanks the Lord for David doing something that's above and beyond and gives God credit for that. And then he says, now, what is he doing? He's acknowledging uh, further that David uh, is going to be the king, that he is right in his position. In other words, the assertion was that God had blessed David to be king and Saul was jealous of that. And that was it. And so what does Saul do? He doesn't just acknowledge, he doesn't just lift David up and move on. He acknowledges that the, that the other person was right. David, you're right. You are king. You will be the king. Everything's going to be as it was said, right? He acknowledges it. So he recognizes, he esteems, he acknowledges. Sometimes it's so hard. I mean, all these are hard. I, I think any of them were easy. Uh, maybe you did, but I, I did. I didn't think they're that easy to make it up. When you've been the bad guy in the situation, it's really hard to make up. It's really hard. Our pride gets in our way, as the Bible often talks about, and Saul was loaded up with it. He had a triple dog, double dog, dose of it. And that's what got him so jealous and so upset and so moody. And he took advantage of his own, apparently maybe he had some sort of issues or something with his anger. It was out of control. And he would have these horrible mood swings and things. And David came, comes and helps him. And then the very person who helps him the most, he, uh, David didn't pick himself to be king. It was God's work. And, and Saul gets jealous of that and jealous, jealous of David's successes, which were really put, David laid him at Saul's feet and said, here, you know, I, this is for you. I serve you, king. I'm your warrior. I'm your uh, musician. I do all these things. I do it for you. And Saul in his ego is expecting that and much more. And, and his ego drives him and drives him. Well, he acknowledges this before David that you're king. This was a big deal. The hardest thing to do is acknowledge that, that the other person was right or whatever they're, whatever they're proposing that caused that we got this relationship wrong. When we're on the Saul side, now I understand you've been on the other side, okay? Most of us have plenty of times. I, as a matter of fact, if we did a survey of people, I assure you that there is not a human that I could imagine that I would run into who has not been wronged by more than one person. The David. In other words, there's a David Saul thing going on here. And we're not talking about David. We're talking about the other side. Everybody's been wronged. Matter of fact, there's only two things that most people talk about in Baptist churches. One of them is what all somebody's done to them is wrong. And the other is, well, uh, you know, about their health, right? I mean, that's just the way it comes out. <laughs> you know, maybe that's not always the way it is, but you know what I mean. Everybody's got a list of what all they've been done wrong by. All right, think about this. Imagine that you're Jesus. And look at your list. 
it goes back to the very beginning. All those people have wronged you. All the way up. And it doesn't just stop there. It goes right on into the future. And all those people are wrong. Imagine that you had to suffer a punishment, if you will, for them. Wronged. Never did a thing wrong. Not bruised anyone, right? Not anyone, right? That's what it is. All the iniquity was laid upon him. Imagine that. So the next time we've been wrong, well, you can be, you can decide whether you're going to be the David or the Saul, I guess. But Saul is the guy who done the wrong. So we're not even, it's not even an issue. Saul is wrong. Saul recognizes it. And that was critical in our confession. We recognize it. We thank the person who, who come to, to, uh, to, to, that we're trying to be reconciled with for bringing this to our attention, for being patient with us in bringing this so that we can have a relationship that we long to have or that we wanted to have or that would be good for us. And so we thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for saving me. And you were right, Lord. I was all these things. You know, and the reason we can say that and we should often be often remind ourselves of that is that God has forgiven us. He has forgiven him, not to remember how bad we were so we can go off and get depressed, but remember how much God has done for us. And if he'll do that, well, these little easy things that we want him to do sometimes that we're so remiss to ask, he'll do those too, that he cares about us. That's how much God cares about us. And so he acknowledges his the position he has in verse 20. He says, I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Very important thing. Very important that we recognize, esteem, and acknowledge. So we've got three letters of our word reap here, all right? Now we need to go on. Notice what happens. So Saul says, you know, I'm wrong, and thank you for bringing it to me, and uh, thank you for uh, that, you're, that I know that you're right. It's not just that I'm wrong, but that you're right. Sometimes that's a big hill. That's got to be one of the hardest things if, if the initial state is that. And then he says, okay, you are right. May I make a request? He says, verse, uh, verse 21, swear to me therefore by the Lord that you will not cut off my offspring. Now understand the context of this. It was very typical, very normal, uh, just as considered to be the thing to do whenever a king takes over another king, they eliminate all the potential heirs. That means to take out the whole family so that nobody says they've got a, a right to the kingship by some sort of bloodline or something like that. They get rid of all the heirs. This was a common thing that happened in that culture. So he says, uh, he says, don't, don't do that. Please don't destroy my name out of my father's house. You have to understand the, the culture and the history to understand this was a big deal. Saul's not saying I'm not worthy of it, but do this for me uh, in honor of my recognition here. I'm willing to, will you keep some of my family? Will you not destroy my whole family so that my name may be preserved in the country, in the land, right? It was a big deal to not be eliminated, to, to be a, uh, completely eliminated. And so he asked David to do that as a, as a, as kind of a, a favor to him and, uh, in, in his, in his humility here. And David says he will, he says he will. So what do we, what's our last one? Well, we got recognized. We've got uh, steam. We've got acknowledged. Now we've got preserve the relationship. So what does this mean? So once Saul has, has, has been willing to acknowledge he's wrong and David's right, the person on the Saul side, the person who, who created the problem is now trying to fix the problem, uh, right? Needs to try to preserve the relationship. We, we had a relationship and I broke it. It was my fault. I did all this stuff. I was wrong. You were right. And uh, guess what? I want to preserve it. Sometimes people are willing to go all the way through step three to acknowledge that you're right and they're wrong, but their pride that, that, that terrible thing gets kind of stays laying down there and they will not make an effort to preserve. In other words, not to just say, okay, you're right, see you later, leave me alone. But basically to preserve a relationship, to keep that connection going, right? That's a, that's a big deal because we all are, when we're hurt, when we, when we and I'm, listen to me, 
If you're the, the herder, when you realize that you're the herder, that you've done the herding and that you've created the problem and you've owned up to it, that doesn't take away your pain. <laughs> that doesn't stop you from feeling like, listen to me, how, let's see if this works, right? So you come to Christ. You say, Lord Jesus, I was wrong. Lord Jesus, thank you for even making it possible for me to even be willing to, uh, to, to be able to come to you. Thank you. I praise your holy name. And Lord, I acknowledge that in all I did, I was wrong. I was a sinner uh, without hope in the world. Did all that stuff that you and me both know, Lord, that I can't even remember. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for showing me that there was another way. And now then, when we expose all that raw emotion, all those feelings, all those failures, right? When we expose all that stuff, does that make you feel good? No. Just because God says, I forgive you, does not change that immediate feeling that you have made such a disaster out of your life. You spent X amount of years, days, months, weeks, whatever it is, failed Terrible. Nobody likes to fail. Nobody likes to fail. Nobody likes to think that they've wasted time. Oh, the years I've wasted, right? We saw, sing about it. The, 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 that all is this all true, right? That, that, that you've been forgiven and God has said, I will. And you accepted that as insist. But guess what? The herd is there. That's why people constantly bring up this issue sometimes, maybe you've heard people ask you, you think I'm really forgiven? You think, uh, you know, I don't know if God can really forgive this or that. We constantly go back and forth. Why? Because we're hurting. We're hurting. So what we need to do is we need to recognize that this is reality and we want to do something to preserve the relationship. We don't want to just have it, acknowledge it and say, good, thank you very much. Uh, now I'll go off and die in the woods because... I've been injured here and I've done my own injury and my own injuries. The things I've done are my injuries, right? The things I've done when they're exposed and put out here become a, become a pain to me, a hurt. And if you don't deal with that, if you don't try to preserve the relationship over these injuries, then you'll keep the injuries and let the relationship go. You'll, you'll be afraid to face that person or talk to them because you feel like every time it happens, you're back to square one again. This is why God says, I have forgiven you and I have listened to me. He says, I have cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. I've cast them into the deepest ocean. In other words, I'm putting this behind us. I'm done with this. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. I've done the deal. So that means that I, as I have done you, if you follow me, I will do for you. So he says, Preserve the relationship. Leave it where it is. Move on from here. Good news is, it's true. We've wasted a lot of time. We've wasted a lot of years. We've wasted a lot of energy. But the Bible says that God will restore the years of locust state. How does that work? I don't think he's going to make us that much older necessarily. But I think he's going to make it so that we can accomplish things that we couldn't accomplish before. And we do that, Right. Sometimes it's just beyond understanding how God can do that. I have sometimes I just have to say, I just don't know how. I mean, I understand what the Bible says and I believe it. But I, you know, because I'm a human being and not God, I can't fathom how that works, how God could do that. I, because I'm still struggling with how I could do it, right? So that might be the reason. Uh, sometimes this uh, out of Proverbs will be helpful. I know you know it, three, five, and six, a little trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make, your, uh, make straight your paths. In other words, we need to trust God. Whenever God says, listen, I've forgiven you, then we need to preserve the relationship. What does that mean? We need to get busy in the, in the, in the context of Christianity here and, and following Jesus. We need to try to you know, become more familiar with God himself. That relationship that was broken, we we're trying to preserve it. So we need to get together and say, you know, come and join a fellowship. Come and study together. Come and grow together with each other. Build those relationships within the community of believers and to preserve that relationship. Saul said, listen, I was wrong. Do not blot me out. Do not blot out my name. 
my family. So that that inheritance, if you will, that going forward is kind of felt brought out in, in the way that we decide as as people who have been who come to the cross and said, Jesus, forgive me. And we want to go out and learn. We want to become disciples. So, you know, this has been about the relationship rebuilding and path of to reconciliation. How do we re reconcile a relationship? Well, we acknowledge the fact that we've all been David. More people got more David stories than they do Saul stories. I'm pretty sure that most of us have been Saul about as many times, if not more than we have David. But we don't, you know, the memory is selective about the good when I was bad and when I was good, right? So we don't remember when we were bad. We only remember when we've been really good. But the fact of the matter is, we looked this morning at Saul. Saul is the guy who was wrong, who was doing the wrong things. And now he's confronted with that situation in the humility and the David. And he, and he recognizes that he was wrong. He lifts up David before the Lord. And he's willing to acknowledge his error, his, his position. David is truly the king. God, you're the king. You're right. I was wrong. Listen to me. What do I got to do to preserve that? Lord, help me. Give me a chance to do to make my amends. Let me have a, play, a plan to do something. Help me to, to not let pass on my bad side to the other people, but pass on my good side. Persevere, right? Persevere. Preserve the relationship. Help me, Lord, to pass this on to other people. So we have the, the word reap, R-E-A-P, recognize, esteem, acknowledge, and preserve. Maybe we can reap a reward before the Lord and others. That ought to be our goal. So if you've been a Saul or you've been a David, I think Saul is the one that's harder to admit to. But maybe here we see a path because Saul certainly has checked a lot of boxes here that we never would have expected. That person we never expect, ourselves, others. Perhaps we can help them as Saul to recognize these things in their life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, this morning. Would you pray with me? Hey, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you this morning, Lord, that we can reap a reward that you promised. Thank you, Lord, this morning that we can, that you were willing to come to us as David came to Saul. That you are willing to Humble yourself here on earth amongst those who hated you and sinned against you all our days. And you're willing, Lord, to offer salvation, forgiveness, eternal life. Help us, Lord, help us to recognize you and to turn away from our Saul self or to help others to turn from their Saul self, to restore a relationship not just with others, Lord, though that's very important and certainly we should, and this will work, but also, Lord, first and foremost with you, that we might reap the rewards of eternal life, of forgiveness and of salvation found only in you, Lord Jesus. We ask these things this morning in Jesus' name.